So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ted Everett, and I'm with CFA Boston's Career Development Committee. Welcome to the webinar. We are joined today by Vern Schellinger of Contacts Count. He will be sharing his firm's process for how to improve your networking and make it an effective part of your career success. Before I introduce Vern, I want to quickly mention we've got a full month of other events coming up, uh, some of which are October 8, we kick off a series behind closed doors, the world of private equity, which will discuss the strategy shaping this asset class. October 9 is a coffee connection gathering focused on fintech. October 15th is a Boston Fintech Week session called Brain, Brawn and Brain Reimagine the Asset Management Value Chain with AI. October 22nd is a lunch and learn discussion about public pensions led by Mass Prim's Francesco Danielle. And October 23rd is a policy update with the Capital Group's Leslie Geller, preparing your high net worth clients for a year of uncertainty, tax changes, and beyond. I'll stop there. That's a full enough month, and that way we can get on with our presenter. <clears throat> so, Vern Schellinger is an accomplished human resources and learning and development professional. He has held senior level positions with organizations as diverse as Dunkin' Donuts, the American Chemistry Council, the American Bankers Association, and Lee Hecht Harrison. With all that experience, he thought he'd come to know everything about networking. Then he discovered Contacts Count. He was so convinced of its approach and its focus on eight core competencies, he bought the company in 2021. Vern holds a master's degree in leadership and organizational change from George Washington University and a bachelor's degree in biology from State University of New York, Cortland. I'll leave uh, any further sharing of his background to Vern, given he is the networking expert. Uh, one final program note, we are recording this event and the slides will be available after the presentation. So uh, Vern, over to you. Well, thank, <clears throat> thanks so much, Ted. And first of all, I wanna thank Ted and Todd and the rest of the group for giving me the opportunity to connect with each of you today. Um, you'll notice that it says the power of human connection, and that's really the outcome uh, of all the work that we do at Contacts Count, uh, creating uh, experiences where human beings help human beings. Um, and I'll get into that in, in a lot more detail as, as we get into the session. Um, I know most of you, maybe all of you will remember Tony Bennett's song, I Left My Heart in San Francisco. Well, I left my heart in uh, Boston. So as, as Ted indicated, a long time, uh, 25 year career with Dunkin' Donuts. Um, my kids grew up here, they went to high school here. My daughter graduated from Boston College. I have a lot of friends in Boston. So I'm always always uh, a little bit uh, uh, happier to talk to all of, all of you up in the Boston area. With that, um, the objective today of, of today's presentation is to introduce you to the eight competencies that Ted talked about. Each of these competencies has skills, behaviors, tools, and strategies that we uh, are, are able to teach people and people are able to learn these and actually improve their ability to build relationships um, and, and ultimately uh, experiences, as I said earlier, the power of human connection. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to the eight competencies, and then we're going to take a deep dive into one of the competencies, and you're actually going to do some, some work on your own to, to create um, a skill that you can use as soon as this webinar is over. Um, feel free to put questions in the chat. Ted and Todd will be monitoring that, and, and if I can answer a question as we go along. That'll be great if it's a quick answer. If it's a longer answer, I may save that till the end of the session where we're going to have a probably a 10 to 15 minute session of uh, Q&A. So I'm going to begin the session with a question for you, and you can put your answer to this question in the chat. Yep. I've got... All right, my clicker is not working. Um... Technical difficulties. Brian, I think if you go back to the PowerPoint presentation and click on it, you'll be able to advance the slides. Okay. 
There you go. Okay. All right. So this is the question <laughs> that I mentioned. What's your answer to this question? What do you believe is the number one predictor of career success? Any answers in the chat? We do. So far, people skills, managing human relationships well, relating to people, mentoring. Okay. Relationships. And... We're getting warmer. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, I, I would imagine this is a pretty, pretty smart group. This question actually uh, was the result of a number of years of studies by data scientists, organizational development professionals, researchers. And there's a lot of variables that go into your success, my success in terms of our careers. But these researchers were trying to answer the question, well, of all these different variables, what's the number one predictor of career success? And the overwhelming result of all of that research was that the number one predictor of career success is an open network. An open network, meaning one that's broad and diverse. Michael Simmons um, did a in-depth review of all of this research, interviewed some of the researchers and the scientists, and he wrote an article for Forbes, and his conclusion was that this one variable uh, accounts for upwards of 50% of your career success in relation to total compensation, number of promotions, industry recognition. The other thing that an open network provides is greater access to the hidden job market. And if you're not familiar with the hidden job market, there is a job market out there where the job is never posted anywhere on the internet. It is simply uh, a way to hire people without going through the whole internet and applicant tracking and everything else. Um, it's And the only way you find out about those opportunities is someone in your network has said to you, hey, I know of this opportunity. Someone just told me about it and I think you'd be a great fit for it. And ultimately you can land a job um, without you know the whole process of applying online. The other fact, uh, and lots of surveys have, have uh, confirmed this, that 60 to 80 percent of all jobs are found via networking. So as Ted said, here are the eight competencies that we use to teach people how to build networks and build relationships. I'm going to give you a quick, um, a quick definition and a little bit of insight into each one, starting with adopting a positive network or identity. Uh, we all have a network or identity. Your identity might be, I hate networking, I don't like it, I tried it, it didn't work. That's your network or identity. Obviously, at Context Count, we're, we want to be at the other end of the spectrum. Um, and what we mean by adopting a positive network or identity <clears throat> is nothing more than to think about conversations that you're having as conversations that we refer to as opportunities for teaching and giving. So networking is really about teaching and giving. So when I'm having a conversation with Ted, one of the things that I'm hoping to accomplish is to teach him something about who I am, what I'm all about. And the more conversations we have, the more opportunities I have to, to teach him more about who I am, what I'm all about, what my problems are, what my challenges are. <clears throat> and at the same time, I'm trying to learn those same things about Ted so that I can give back to Ted. And this is the beginning. This mindset is just critical to all of the other competencies because without that uh, belief that it's about teaching and giving, none of the other skills and, and, that, and the behaviors make sense. So the second competency is communicate your expertise. This is the teaching competency where there are skills and behaviors that make it easier for you to teach people about who you are. Engaging others is the competency that really focuses on learning about other people so that you can give back to them. Now, taking a strategic approach is something that I'm guessing most of you do 
But what we find is most people don't think about a strategic report um, approach when it comes to networking. I'm just talking to people. What what what's involved with a strategic approach? As you hear what I'm about to say, I'm, like I said, I'm sure sure you do this. When it comes to networking, what is your goal? What is your objective? What are you trying to achieve? Start with that and then think about, well, who are the people that I know in my network that might help me? Who are the people that are not in my network that I'd like to meet? Um, so you're strategizing your approach to networking before you ever have a conversation. And then obviously you've, you've got to do the, the work of, you know, you know, reaching out, connecting with people, setting up times to meet, and then make sure you've, you've created your own agenda. I mean, what questions specifically are you going to ask? What help um, can, can people give you? Who might they connect you to that might help you if they can't? And obviously, and again, I'll go back to teaching and giving. Don't make those networking conversation a one-way street. I'm reaching out to you. I need your help, and you know, it's it. Then I'm then I'm more like taking from you than than thinking about giving back to you. <clears throat> so always, you know, prepare questions that you want to ask them. Not only about your situation, but take the opportunity to learn more about who they are. Developing trust-based relationships is actually looking at every single conversation you have with any person, anywhere, any place, and understanding the level of trust that exists with that person at that point in time. Obviously, when you meet someone for the very first time, there's little to no trust. But as you have multiple conversations with someone, the possibility exists that you may, in, in fact, both of you begin to develop trust. And you don't want to be in a position where you're asking for too much too soon or you're asking for too little too late. Um, so it's it's um, that's why this is kind of an advanced uh, um, um, uh, competency. And, and you can see we've divided them into those those three different levels. You need the foundational skills to get started, but then the the understanding the the development of, of a relationship gets a little bit more um, a little you have to be a little bit more conscious of exactly what you're saying when you're saying it who you're saying it to <clears throat> networking gracefully is nothing more than understanding the etiquette and the rules of of networking the things that happen in in networking whether it's a networking event or just a one on one meeting for instance. Uh, if I ask how many of you are good at remembering names, I'm sure it would be a fairly low percentage because most people say they simply can't remember people's names. There are skills and behaviors you can employ to help you better remember people's names. It's about how you do how do you join a group at a networking event? How do you how do you leave a group? Um, those types of, of rituals that, that exist anytime you're you're having a conversation with someone else. Envisioning your ideal network is the, it, it is around the fact that we have at least four distinct networks in our lives. What are those networks? Who are the people in the networks? How do you manage and and interact with people in those four different worlds? to get the maximum value, the maximum return on your investment um, for all of the effort and time that you put into to networking and building relationships. And then the last competency, achieving more, giving more, <clears throat> is all about uh, your actual personal reputation. When you've really mastered networking, people see you as someone who is um, someone willing to give, willing to help people, and they're willing to help you, which helps you achieve more. So let me stop there. And if there's any quick questions on, you know, I know that's a lot of information in a short period of time. Ted, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them at this point. Well, other than more detail on all eight, I guess. <laughs> I think maybe we just plow ahead unless there are questions uh, all right. and we leave yeah. them till the end. Um, okay. Um, so 
uh, a number of you, uh, in fact, and then uh, you were all, a number of you were given the opportunity to take the networking competency assessment, which actually is an online assessment that measures your skills and abilities in each one of these competencies. Um, I'm about to show you a, a slide that is an average of all of the people who completed the networking competency assessment. So when I show that to you, um, take a look at it and put your response or questions in the chat. And this is out of 100. Yes, 55 is the overall average out of 100. Questions, comments, thoughts? We've got work to do. <laughs> OK. Well, let me, get, let me give you some context for what you're seeing on, on this slide. Uh, the score for your group is no different than the score for almost every other group that we've worked with. Um, upwards of 60% or more of the average scores for all the groups that we work with fall between 40 and 60. So the 55 is right in that range. Um, there are individuals who like, you know, from 61 to 79, um, you know, they score higher. They've actually got some skills, but they could still show improvement in, in certain areas. And then there's the rarefied error where our three to 5% of the people score above 80 on every one of these competencies the very first time they take the assessment. Last week, I was in Washington, D.C. and did a program for the Georgetown Law students, and their average score was, I think, 57 uh, I did a major program for a biotech firm, global biotech firm, 120 leaders. These were directors, vice presidents, senior vice presidents. Their average score was 62. So this is typically what we see when we use this network and competency assessment. And it becomes the, the foundation of all of the work that we do because whether it's an individual coaching program or a group program, um, we start with this, and then at the end of the program or at the end of whatever the, the, the assignment is, we have people take the networking competency assessment again, and almost without a, you know, without any, uh, you know, failure, people improve their scores in these, in this networking competency assessment. Improving, Vern, yeah, uh, just, so just real quick, I think we have some interest in folks who would like to take it just while we're on the subject, the best way for them to do that would be what? Um, the best way, the last slide, I, I've got the URL to connect okay. to, the, to, okay. that, to, to, that, um, to that network and competency assessment. Okay, so um, more, to, more to follow. Yeah, so um, any other questions or comments on, on this, Ted, in the, in the chat? Not that I see, no, just someone okay. asking uh, if they could get to it. Uh, yep. could, sure, certainly. Yeah. Okay, so this is a little bit more of a deep dive into the first competency. Uh, you know, develop a positive network or identity. This is a definition of networking from the book Strategic Connections that we wrote. And as you read this, um, put in the chat a word or a phrase that kind of jumps out at you in terms of this definition of networking. Mutually beneficial seems to be the winner. Yeah. Okay. And and again, uh, the 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 first slide said the power of human connection, and when you when you develop and you're able to develop mutually beneficial and I will add trust based relationships, that's where the outcome, the payoff. That's why. You know, this is the number one predictor of career success. Um, and this is about teaching and giving. And again, deliberate process. So it, obviously, you've got to have a conversation with someone 
Um, that may be, it, it could be serendipitous, but you know, typically it's a meeting or it's going to a, a networking event. And again, exchanging all of these things that you're exchanging, you're teaching and giving, or you're teaching and learning about other people so that over time you build trust and, and that mutually beneficial relationship is what really pays off for you. Now, this is the textbook definition. I don't expect you to memorize this by the time you leave the session, but here's a shorter version that I know you can um, uh, memorize. And I've already alluded to this. Networking is not about talking and taking. It's about teaching and giving. When a relationship is manipulative or one-sided, that's not what contacts count is all about. That's not mutually beneficial. Um, and if you're in any of those relationships, <laughs> you should get out of them as quickly as you can. <laughs> um, there's lots of myths about networking. It's only for ex extroverts. That's a myth. It, the other myth is introverts can't network or they you know, don't want to network. That's not true. Um, maybe 40, 50 years ago, it was just for job seekers and sales professionals, but the, 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 the world has changed dramatically and there's almost nothing that's done today without some type of collaboration, some type of teamwork, some type of interaction between, you know, two or more people, which obviously makes it, it's not optional in today's, you know, workplace not to be able to, to, to be uh, thinking about building relationships. So this slide is just kind of a review of everything I've said. <clears throat> Intentional exchange, teaching and giving, lots of learned behaviors, and it's about building relationships, mutually beneficial relationships. So with that, we're going to move to the second competency, which is called communicate your expertise. This is the teaching competency. And how many of you, you could raise your hand, how many of you have been asked the what do you do question? And I'm guessing if you raised your hand, it's probably 100% of the people. <laughs> Everybody's going to raise their hand to that, right? <clears throat> so the what do you do question is the first opportunity that you have to teach someone something about yourself. And the problem is that most people answer the what do you do question in a way that's not very helpful. Most of the answers fall into several different categories. I'm the vice president of human resources. Um, I'm, I work for Amazon. I'm a cybersecurity expert. I'm an attorney. I'm a registered nurse. Those, and so it's a profession, industry, title type of thing. If I say I'm the VP of human resources, well, you all understand what human resources is and you understand, you know, okay, so these are the VP level. But the question is, what do you do and that really doesn't answer the question. And the second problem is it doesn't, it, it, you miss the opportunity to begin to teach someone about who you are. And so when you are able to be, you know, first of all, recognize this is the opportunity and respond in a way that you're teaching the other person something about either your character, your interests, or your abilities. Um, so when you, you, you try to make sure that in every conversation you're commuting, commun communicating something about what we refer to as CIA. It's not the Washington agency. It's simply an acronym to remember. You know, this is a simple acronym, acronym to remember. These are the things that I want to teach people um, about who I am and what I'm all about. <clears throat> and obviously you're listening at the same time for their um for, their, for, for any insight you get into any of their character, their interests, their abilities. Now, character, there's lots of different character traits. And the, the character traits are a little tricky because I might say to Ted that, you know, in the conversation, he might say, well, so you sound like a pretty dependable person or something like that. And I say, yeah, I'm really dependable. Um, and then I 
offer to send him an article, but I forget to send it to him. And he reaches out to me and says, you know, you didn't send me the article. And then I, another couple of weeks go by and I have, still haven't, you know, uh, sent the article. So the character traits, uh, trust, integrity, dependability, those types of things, it, it's perfectly okay to, to talk about that in a conversation. But if you want the person really to trust you, then you've got to demonstrate over time that you, that you do have those character traits. Interest, both professional and personal, there's just a million different interests all of us are involved in, and our abilities, our, our skills and our expertise. So, as I said, most people answer the what do you do question in a way that's not helpful. At Contacts Count, <clears throat> we suggest that you answer the what do you do question with two sentences. You keep it short and to the point. The first sentence is something, it's one thing you do best. You want to teach something about yourself. And the second sentence is a testimonial, an example, save the day, solve the problems, you know, serve the client. So the first sentence, this is a skill and expertise that I'm really good at. The second sentence is, and here's an example of me using that skill for some type of positive outcome. Here are some examples that I'll give you a chance to read just so you get a feel for what this looks like. Again, it's short and it's to the point. So you are now going to get an opportunity to create your first best test answer. <clears throat> Let me, before I go, there are any questions on what I've said so far? All of this pretty straightforward? There is a hand raised with Michael. Okay. Sorry, I forgot to lower my hand. Okay. <laughs> no worries. No Must problem. be tired. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. So, so again, um, to sit down and I'm actually going to ask you now to, to write your first attempt at creating a best test answer based on what you do do. And the way you do this is, first of all, you need to think of the skill, the talent, the expertise that you want to include in this best test answer. You create the first sentence, I'm an expert in my firm, I create, I help, I, my passion. These are just examples. It's really important for you to use your own words, words that you're comfortable with. And then obviously you write a second sentence where you, you, you outline or, or talk about the results you've achieved. This typically is uncomfortable for people to begin with. Uh, it, 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 it is a skill that you're trying to learn and, um, it takes, it takes a while to, to actually get this down. So you're going to write your first draft in a, in a minute here. And the first draft is never the final product. Um, and I'm going to ask you after you've had a chance to write them, I'm going to ask for some volunteers to unmute themselves and share your first draft with the rest of the group. I can give you some feedback. I can point out some some things that you know others need to know about creating a best test answer. So remember, it's two sentences, not two paragraphs. Uh, this is the biggest common mistake. People have a really hard time condensing it down to two sentences. And again, as I said, it's uncomfortable. The, the in today's session, probably when I ask, you know, if somebody volunteers and I say, "Okay, uh, Michael, what do you do?" You know, you're going to have to pick it up and just read it off the piece of paper because you just haven't got this ingrained yet to to be able to to say it, um, you know, at, at the drop of a hat. So you get feedback, you get re, you know, refine it, update, you know, update it, and and you keep practicing it until you can say you know, respond as easily as when someone asks you your name. <clears throat> so I'm going to give you three minutes 
to create a best test answer. I'm going to start the clock. And if anyone has questions about it, uh, certainly put them in the chat and, and Ted can uh, relay them to me and I can, I can give, I can answer any questions while you're doing this. So three minutes and the clock is on. Unless you're a born marketer, this is going to feel awkward, but go ahead and give it a shot. Yeah. Hopefully somebody volunteers so I don't have to be the guinea pig. <laughs> We need the Jeopardy soundtrack to count down. Yep, one minute left. <laughs> Okay, 15 seconds. Okay, time is up. Do we have a, uh, a volunteer who wants to share their best test answer, their first draft? I see a hand up. It looks like Bill Hannigan. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'll give it a shot. Okay, um, Bill. So uh, what you do you do, Bill? What do you do? Well, I believe in lifelong learning. Uh, and so as an education advocate, uh, I look to uh, further educational opportunity through philanthropy and through uh, my work as a board member at a local charter school. Okay. And That's I've learned a lot cool. about how to positively impact the lives of young people through this work. Okay, that so so that last sentence is is really the testimonial. So when when you say you've impacted the lives of a lot of young people, that's that's the punchline. So I I I take the first couple of sentences you had and and just try to maybe condense them a little bit. I'm a lifelong learner. I'm an educator. Um, and through my work, I've influenced the life of, of you know a number of young people. One of the one of the accomplishments I'm most proud of of my life. That work. Okay, and again, I will say these things because this is what comes into my head immediately, or trying to help people, you know, improve it. 
but I will again emphasize these have to, this has to be your words. You have to be comfortable with, with, with exactly what you're saying. Any other volunteers? I think we got one, Sam Seekins. Sam? Uh, are we doing just the best or the best and the test? The best and the test. Best and the test, okay. Um, so what do I do? I uh, manage and optimize the personal balance sheets of successful uh, business owners and executives um, that often have recently kind of hit that high net worth category. Um, one example is, you know, a, a real estate businessman who had spent his entire career uh, owning a lot of real estate assets and is finally ready to retire and, and sell um, and asked my team and I to build him a very income oriented uh, portfolio and, you know, get his personal finances in order um, for, you know, his retirement and, and his wife. Okay. <clears throat> you got the, you got the essence of a best test there but it's it, it's it's a little too long, Sam. So so repeat the first sentence. Repeat the best. Re, repeat the first one. Um, I manage and optimize the personal balance sheets of uh, high net worth executives and business owners. Okay, so that that's fine. That tells you what you do. The second piece, you know, here's an example. I worked with a real estate executive, and I created, you know, you you fill in the blanks there. I created this. And, you know, and what was the, what was the outcome from creating the, you know, whatever you created for them? Um, are, are you actually asking that or are you saying that's, no, that I'm, at, I'm asking okay. you if you can, I'm just trying to shorten it. In other words, Got it. So, so, you know, the, the best part is, you, you know, you, here's what I do. Here's what I'm really good at. Right. And here's an example and just keep the example with the real estate e executive shorter um, I recently worked with a real estate agent, um, or a real estate executive or investor, or whatever the person was, <clears throat> and, and, and try to keep that to, to, to one sentence. It could be a longer sentence, but, but keep it to, to, to one sentence, that, that second part. Got it. Yeah. Because all you're trying to do <clears throat> is, you know, someone says, you know, what do you do? And you just want something to, to to begin the conversation. Here's what I do. Now, here's where it gets, um, here's where you need to be conscious of this whole thing of teaching and giving. A really good best test answer will encourage people, if they're so inclined, it'll encourage them to ask you more questions. And And that's, that what well, basically what they're saying then. So I'll go back to Bill. Bill impacted the lives of uh, you know lots of young people. Uh, I might say, wow, that that's really an accomplishment. Uh, Could you give me an example of how you you know impacted the life of one one of the the young people? It it it, it kind of opens the door. Not all the time because this is the other thing you need to be conscious of. So you could give the best best test answer ever. And the other person says, oh, that's nice. That's interesting. And they, they don't say anything else. So in those cases, then you, you, you automatically, you, what you have to learn is automatically shift to the other side of the coin. So Bill, tell me a little bit about you. What do you do? And then focus on getting them to learn, to learn as much as you can about them. Because most people will... Once you encourage them to talk about themselves, most people will, um, not everybody. And, and that's the other thing about networking. <clears throat> not every single interaction you're going to have is going to be, you know, like this perfect conversation. But the more skilled you get at these competencies, skills, and behaviors, the more often you're going to see success. So, Burn, um, Burn I wanted to just add one tweak to that. Sam mentioned that when he does this it's when people reach a certain level of wealth and there's a trigger event or a, or a threshold i think that's important and that that is intriguing to say oh am i at that level or yeah. Yeah, i i think that's if you can figure out if that's critical to what you do that 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 trigger level is important figure out a way to put that in that first yeah. uh first sentence or or a way to 
put it in the story because that's going to generate that next question. Yeah, that's a that's a good insight, Ted. Yep, thanks for adding that. Um, is that Paul Jones? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. I said I enjoy taking on new projects to advance client goals. As the read industry expanded, the definition of real estate, I added expertise in sectors such as timber, life science, communication, and data centers to help our investment strategies outperform. Okay. Um, all right. So, so do the do one sentence at a time. Do the do the best sentence first. So I enjoy taking on new projects to advance client goals. Okay. Um, can 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 you be more specific? Could you say, I really enjoy taking on projects like X Y Z. In other words, what 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 you said seems pretty pretty general. Uh, in other words, it's not it's not I you enjoy taking on the projects. But it's not communicating a skill and expertise. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, Vern, so I'm, Vern, I'm in the investment business, and I'm not sure I understand all what what you do. And I would assume you're in the investment business, but that sentence well, yeah, really yeah, convey I'm it. Yeah, I'm just trying to put it in a way that doesn't just, like you said, not to use the title of portfolio manager or, mm -hmm. and so you know. Um, I guess what I'm trying to communicate, and it goes back to a little bit what Bill said about being, a, I mean, I consider myself a lifelong learner too. And, um, you know, part of what I've uh, done over time is I've had to learn about various new industries as the definition of commercial real estate gets expanded in the public markets. And so trying to coalesce around that is that, you know, you know, when, when there is, has been, the need for someone to step up and take on new responsibilities that I've been the one that's done that. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm open to any better way to, to word it, or if that's too vague, try to come up with something more narrow. Well, again, the, um, what, what you're saying is, is perfectly, you know, there's nothing wrong with what you're saying. Um, it's, it's not, and, and that's certainly something you you'd want to communicate to someone else that you know that you're teaching them about who you are and what you do. Um, I guess where I'm struggling is you know the best test is really what's the skill, what's the expertise in the first sentence, and then a simple example of how you used it, and then based on that you might then add you know um, something about being you know a life you know there's your best test answer. And and you might say, I you know I'm a lifelong learner, and I, it's taken me a while to learn these skills and and get these kind of results. But I'm I'm continually and you know improving my skills and my my learning. Okay. So that you know kind of be two sentences. But again, but you'd right. be teaching again. You'd be teaching something. So if you're saying about lifelong learner, then then you you you've indicated to me that you know you you've told me something about yourself. Okay. And, and, and for, and again, it depends on who you're talking to. So for me, if somebody says they're a lifelong learner, I'm all in automatically because I'm a lifelong learner. Okay. Uh, you know, tell me some of the things that now I now I can start to ask you questions. Tell me, tell me some of the things that you're really interested in as a lifelong learner. Um, and, and, Again, the more you use these skills, the more natural it becomes to to ask questions, to learn, to to respond, and and you continue to learn about each other, with the uh, again ultimate goal of being able to help one another in some way. It, the 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 help could be as simple as you know sending you an article that I know you'd be interested in, or at the other end of the spectrum, uh, it's. I just heard about this job, this opportunity that I think you'd, you know, that you'd be really well qualified for. Are you interested in it? And so, and everything in between. Right. Vern, I, I, Go ahead, Ted. I, I, um, I think, well, you, you tell me, but I, I think people shouldn't be afraid to use their job title if it is explanatory. Vice president tells you nothing, but portfolio manager tells you something. 
as yeah. long as you add color to it. If you say I'm a portfolio manager in an increasingly wide range of asset classes within real estate or or projects within real estate, that both describes what you do and it gets to the sense that you've had this growing level of responsibility. And then the test is, this is what I do. I'm a lifelong learner, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah. yep. you know, you can, as long as you get the right words in there, people will, will get it, right? Yep. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Yeah, this isn't, you know, this isn't uh, hard and fast. There's only exactly one way to do it. But there, but there is there is uh you know better ways to do it and again as, as i said the the one common mistake is people just there's too much there for somebody to take in two sentences they 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 just say too much and, and you try to keep it as concise as possible and as impactful as possible um other questions comments now on because we're getting up against the the one o'clock uh, time frame here. Questions on anything? Best test? Uh, any of the competencies? Can I ask a question? Um, are there any general rule? Do any of these rules change for someone who's not currently working but looking? Mm, no. All right. Yeah, I mean, if you're in the in the job search process, um, if you're going through career transition, then again, networking is really critical to your success. Um, um, in fact, when I left Dunkin' Donuts uh, after 25 years, um, during my time at Dunkin' Donuts, and this is a learning paradigm, I would have described myself as the unconscious incompetent. I didn't know how to spell networking. I didn't care to know how to spell networking. I didn't care anything about networking. I was, you know, having a great successful career. The first week of leaving Dunkin' Donuts and getting into the job search, I became the conscious incompetent. I realized how much little, how little I knew about networking and how critical it was to find a job. So Absolutely, all of this applies to, to any job search process because you want to teach as many people as possible about who you are, what you do, what your skills are. And then just maybe that might, you know, by saying, you know, you've got skills in this area, somebody might say, oh, wow, I just, you know, I, I, I just heard about a job that, you know, you might be interested in. Now, that's always a long shot, but it happens. I, in fact, the, the job that I finally landed after Dunkin' Donuts I was talking to someone and she almost hung up on the hung, hung up the phone. She says, Oh, wait, I did get a call from an executive recruiter in New York City that they were looking for a strategic HR person in the Washington, DC area. Literally, that and that ended up getting me that job. So um really important in 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 job in the job search process to to network and talk to as many people as you can. Thanks. Yeah. Burn, one of the competencies is be strategic. And I wonder what concrete steps that might be. It's too, too often we go to a networking event and we leave disappointed that we talked to three people, didn't really have a strategy. What, how would that, you know, how would that manifest? What, what would a specific strategy look like? Some of the steps we could take because it's a little well, hard to know. Yeah. So to begin with, if if you're you see a networking event and you say, oh, that's something I'm interested in, I would do everything I can to learn as much about what that networking event is. Who are the types of people? Now, you may or may not be able to do some of this, but but is there a list of people that have signed up for this networking event? And, you know, again, can you track you? I probably as long as you have a name, you can go to LinkedIn and start to see the type of people that would be there. Um, because you're right, uh, this is another you know, difficult part about networking and why, why people get turned off from the networking is because without a strategy and they just go to a networking event, they meet three, like you said, three people, nothing much happens and they go, boy, that was a waste of time. So being strategic is I'm going to this networking event for this reason, because A, there are going to be people there in my field 
and I, you know, I'd like to meet more people in my specific field. I'm going to this networking event um, because it's it's sometimes networking events have a theme, and if it's a theme that you're interested in, or or you know, um, or even if sometimes a networking event has some type of presentation, um, you know, that's that's another reason to go there. Two quick questions. Yep. If you're, I, well, one might not be quick, but one, someone's asking, uh, can you talk about the four distinct networks? Just quickly identify what those are. Yep, I can do that pretty quickly. So the, the first network is your, what we refer to as your work net. Now, some of you, your work net, and, and this is more for, think of an organization. And, and I know not all of you might not be in a, an organization. You might be an independent um, you know, consultant yourself, but if you're in an organization, it's your work net. So um, it's the 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 people that day in, day out, week in and week out, you get, you know, you get your work done. Um, you know, if you're in the finance and accounting department and there's 25 people in the finance and accounting department, then those 25 people are your work net. Now, if the organization is 500 people, there's another 475 people in that organization that you could meet, that you could develop a relationship with. And it's a pretty easy way to, you know, expand your network and learn about other people because you both work for the same organization. So there's your work net, your organizational network, or your organizational net. And again, for people that, like if you're a solo entrepreneur, um, you don't really have an organizational net as a solo entrepreneur, you may have a collection of people that, you know, that you're dependent on to help you get your work done. Um, you know, as, as a individual, you know, coach or consultant, I mean, I've got a virtual assistant and I've got somebody doing marketing, but it's not, it's not the same as, a, as an organization where there's 100 or 200 or 500 people. The third net is your professional net. So this is an example with everybody on this call. This is your professional network. These are other people who do similar things to what you do. And then the last, uh, the fourth network is your personal network, family, friends. And a lot of times, <clears throat> family and friends, we don't talk about our work. And it's typically one of the four networks that is underutilized or undervalued by people. They don't, you know, they, they don't think about talking about their work or their problems with their family and friends. But, you know, you might have a, a, a brother-in-law who, you know, all of a sudden can connect you to somebody who becomes your client. So you, you just never know. Great, great. Uh well, another question is much more tactical. How do you gracefully disengage from a conversation you don't want to be in? Yeah. Um, do that is to say something like, you know, I really enjoyed talking to you. Uh, thanks for the for the information. There are several other people here at this networking event that that I you know I'd like to to talk to. So been great talking to you, and you know, shake their hand or whatever, and and try to you know, gracefully leave that, you know, now the worst case scenario is somebody who gloms onto you and then follows you around, but you know, right. that, that right. doesn't happen too much. Uh, and, and don't, um, the other side of that is don't feel obligated to continue to have this conversation with this person who won't let go. Okay. You, you know, that is not in your best interest. And typically, you know, when you've met those type of people at a networking event, um, I'm not sure. Obviously, they're not skilled at networking, and and they probably are not the type of people that that can really help you in some way. So, uh, that's um, that's that's the best answer I can give for that. I mean, it's never a you know, there's not right, a perfect a way to do that. But again. Thanks. Thanks for taking the time to chat with me. You know, it's great getting, you know, getting to know you. Uh, there's some other people that I, I, you know, I'd like to meet while we're here. And, uh, you know, uh, don't say, 
you may not want to say keep in touch because <laughs> they, they make, you know, if it's somebody. And, and so that's the other thing about networking. I mean, it's not a perfect world. There's everybody's different. Everybody's got their individual personalities and traits and some people you're going to click with and some you're not. And for the people that you don't click with, just, you know, just move on. Uh, our, our lives are too busy and too complicated to begin with to, to, to have anchors around uh, people that we don't want to be connected to. Right. It's it's a numbers game, much like marketing, where you're going to talk to 10 prospects and three aren't interested, three aren't ready, and three or four are are going to respond. So same kind yeah. of numbers yeah. game. Yeah. So we're, we're coming up on the hour. Um, I think you have some resources maybe for yeah. folks. Why don't yeah. we shift to that? And um, that the one thing that I I'll, let me do this real quick. This okay. is a quote to remember. OK, by this guy, you know, who you all know. Learning is an experience. Everything else is just information. And so I gave you a lot of information in a short period of time. And so if you're really interested in improving your networking skills, you've really got to dig in and start to, you know, figure out how am I going to, you know, learn these things. So for like the best test answer, keep practicing it, keep getting feedback, and and you'll you'll create your own learning experience. Uh, let me go. I'm going to go through this one and you know we're up against time. And move on. You'll have these slides, so you can look at those those quotes. So, if you want feedback on your best test answer, feel free to reach out to me. You're going to get a copy of these slides. So, um, you know, there's the contact information to take the networking competency assessment. Here's a link to take that. And to learn more about contacts count, you can go to the website. And if you're really interested in digging in and and you really want to, you know, up your game in networking, uh, you know. Like, whoop, I'm sorry. Networking like a pro, there is a new program that we've just launched for Contacts Count called, um, it's a cohort coaching program where it's a small group of people that go through and take a deep dive in each and every one of the eight competencies. So um, with that, um, thank you again, Ted and Todd and the rest of the group for allowing me to, to share with you uh, contacts, counts, approach to networking. Well, thank you for, for sharing it with us today. I want to say one more thing. I think you have a book if folks are looking for another way to learn this stuff. Yeah, in uh, fact, there's, there's two books that we've written. <clears throat> the first of which is called Make Your Contacts Count. And um, that book was you're going to, that book was written in 2006. So you might say, wow, that's really old. <clears throat> Last September or October, the Wall Street Journal listed Make Your Contacts Count as one of the five most important books to read about your career. So I was pleased as punch to see that it stood the test of time. Um, Hopefully you got a bump in sales. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, the um, the second book is called Strategic Connections, the new face of um, networking in a collaborative world. That was written uh, 2015, 2016, and it was more focused on how to use the skills of networking within an organization. Um, and that was the, the first book where we included the actual eight competencies. So if you read that book, you'd be learning more about each one of these competencies. Um, so, and both of them are available on Amazon and they're pretty, you know, they're like $7, $8, $10, something like that. They're not very expensive. <clears throat> so if folks weren't able to write that down fast enough, they could shoot you an email for more information, or or perhaps we could send that info when we send out slides if folks are looking for those. Yeah, I could I can send you uh, you know the links to to those uh, yeah. as soon as we're done. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And your cohort group, you are still in the process of pulling that together. Still, still uh, again to to do the cohort group. Uh, you know, I've, it's a maximum size of eight because, again, if it gets too much bigger than that, it's 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 not, 
you're not really getting the individual connections that that you'd like to, and it's harder for me to manage. So mm -hmm. anywhere from three to four to six to eight people, once I get three or four people, because then again, this is a new program, I'm going to go ahead and run it. I've already run a, a pilot test of that, and it worked extremely well. So I'm I'm pretty positive that uh, as people go through this, they're going to have a, a, a pretty in-depth learning experience and, and really make a difference uh, in terms of their networking skills. And, so, and what what what's sort of the length of program time commitment or or just so folks understand? Okay, it's a it's an eight week program, um, and the and the the eight it, it, it sometimes it gets spread out to like nine or ten weeks because I really look at the calendar because in between each coaching session, uh, there are assignments. Um, okay. And people are actually, in other words, for instance, one of the assignments is to do an informational interview. So find one, someone who's a great networker and, and the informational interview from A to Z, everything you need to do is, is provided for you. Um, so the sessions, the, the coaching sessions, depending on the number of people, 60 to 75 minutes, and then you've probably got to commit another 60 or plus 60 to 90 minutes during the week to complete some of the, some of the assignments. Okay. And there's probably more information on your website if folks were. Yeah. There's, interested. yeah. If you, if you go to that, there's a, there's a page on the website that says, uh, you know, products and services. And if you, you, you click on the products and services, there's, there's a short description of the cohort coaching program. And there's a button that says learn more. And if you click that, it gives you the, the okay. full description. So good. Well, yeah. we're a little little over the hour. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Thank you, Vern, for presenting. Hopefully, we left everyone with some food for thought and uh, some homework to do. Um, well, and and the, we'll... again, feel free to reach out to me uh, questions after the session and that type of thing. You'll you'll have my email address. So that's part of giving back, right? That's right.